The B-Sides DC 2016 videos are brought to you by clearjobs.net and cybersecjobs.com, tools for your next career move, and Antietam Technologies, focusing on advanced cyber detection, analysis, and mitigation. Thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Jacob Holcomb. Uh, I'm Principal Security Analyst at Independent Security Evaluators, and today I'm going to be talking to you about um, hospital exploitation, uh, specifically attacking patient health. Um, so really quick, as I said, my name's Jacob Holcomb. Um, I specialize in application and network security. Uh, I really love exploit development. Since 2012, I've disclosed approximately um, 100 vulnerabilities, or I've received, rather, I've received 100 CVEs for vulnerabilities that I've publicly disclosed. Um, in total, over my security, or my professional security uh, career, I've probably found upwards of about 1,000 bugs. Um, and why do I do this? Because security is incredibly important. So really quick, about ISC, um, we're a hacking company, uh, simply put. Um, we're computer scientists, hackers, and just individuals who like to break things. So that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, our clients are anybody that is in need of protecting assets. So if you had a critical asset and it needs to be protected from the bad guys, that's what we're here for. And the biggest difference between us and a lot of other security uh, companies is our perspective. Uh, we primarily focus on white box assessments as opposed to the black box uh, testing methodology. Um, so really quick, some of the research that we've done in the past uh, is listed on this slide. Uh, we've done a lot of work with Soho routers and network storage systems, and that gave birth to um, two very popular uh, events um, today, Sopusly Broken and IoT Village, which you see here. Um, we actually are running the Sopusly Broken CTF contest here at B-Sides DC, so if you haven't checked it out, you should go do that. Okay, so to kind of get down to business, why um, hospital security is important. Um, security in general is, is very important, but when it comes to hospitals, it's of greater importance because we start talking about the well-being of individuals, and you know, people are obviously in a hospital because they're hurt, sick, whatever. So why this is important is because hospitals are being targeted, uh, medical equipment is being exploited, and patient health must be protected. Otherwise, it's very likely that a patient could die from a cyber attack. So the topics we're gonna talk about today are the introduction of this, uh, my, I guess my presentation, um, examine security aspects, and then the recommendation. The examine security aspects will be uh, topics that will be covered um, throughout the presentation that are basically a recap of the research that we've performed over the past couple of years. So, introduction. I guess the goal of the healthcare research uh, was to demonstrate that an attacker could compromise a patient, uh, the health of a patient. Uh, more specifically, uh, we were focused on whether or not it was feasible for a adversary from a remote perspective to be able to induce harm to a patient, um, as opposed to going after medical records, um, which is a, a common um, vector of attack these days. Um, this research results from our assessment of 12 healthcare facilities, uh, two healthcare data facilities, uh, the assessment of four medical devices, as well as uh, the assessment of a couple of uh, web-based applications that were EHR to be specific. Um, and then securing patient health, very important. Okay, so for the implementation flaws, we're gonna talk about some implementation issues that arise in some of these devices. So they're gonna be common application and web application security vulnerabilities. And then we're gonna actually uh, dissect a couple of real world attack scenarios. And these attack scenarios are um, ways in which remote adversaries are able to break into a hospital and induce patient harm. And these aren't theoretical. Uh, we've actually were able to do these throughout our research uh, with the cooperation of hospitals that participated in our study. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, the meat of the presentation. So here are the examined medical devices. I mentioned that there were four of them. Uh, two of them are redacted as we're currently going through responsible disclosure with the manufacturer. Uh, but we have two devices listed here from GE, and they happen to be uh, Carescape, Carescape um, patient monitors. There's a B650 and a B850. And here is a list of some of the vulnerabilities that were found in the devices. So some pretty common things like the use of outdated software, um, as well as some common web vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting or cross-site request forgery. And then you have some more serious issues like command injection um, or memory corruption, which would lead to some form of um, 
remote exploit. So vulnerability example number one, uh, we're going to talk about the use of dynamically constructed database queries. So this is really the vulnerability and the attack that is common with this vulnerability is SQL injection. And SQL injection uh, vulnerabilities are the direct result of an application taking input supplied by a user and then using that in the construction of dynamic queries that are then sent to the database. So it allows an attacker to manipulate you know, the underlying query structure and you know, access parts of the database they shouldn't have access to. So as you can see on the slide here, we actually have a, uh, a web portal and we're presented with a login page. Um, it's kind of hard for you guys to see, but this is the login page to a monitoring system um, for a hospital. Um, and this allows you to monitor patient monitors, all the patient monitors that you have deployed, I guess, in a hospital or on a floor or however your deployment may work. Um, and you can't really read that. So basically what I'm demonstrating here is that we're attempting to log into this portal with the username of Gimpy and some bunk password. And there is some red text at the bottom that says that the password is actually incorrect, so we're unable to log in. Um, on this slide, I'm demonstrating that, again, we're trying to log in, except the username isn't just Gimpy, it's Gimpy and a very, very trivial SQL injection payload. You know, your common or one equals one attack, and then just a bunk password here, it's showing the interception of the request going from the client to the web server, and it happens to be in a binary format, uh, which in this particular case was uh, AMF. Um, and you can actually see the highlighted payload, the GIMPy or one equals one payload. And when that was sent to the server, we're given this magical response that is different than what we saw when we were unable to log in. So, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Well, as soon as our browser receives this response, we're presented with this lovely page. Um, and we're essentially able to bypass authentication by injecting a very trivial payload. So the very common example of SQL injection that you may have learned about when you were first, you know, I don't know, curious about what SQL injection is, exists in a medical device that is used, you know, within a hospital. Um, so it kind of shows you the state of security of these devices. It's, it's fairly weak. Um, the next attack example we're going to talk about is insufficient input validation and output sanitization. And this refers to a very common web-based attack known as cross-site scripting. And again, like most vulnerabilities, uh, cross-site scripting results uh, from the application taking raw user input and again, and then using that without properly validating or sanitizing the output. Um, so here, this is a less complex example, just showing the typical JavaScript alert box, saying like, hey, medical device, cross-site scripting. Um, this is in the GE Carescape uh, monitor, as you can see, GE Healthcare logo in the top right. And vulnerability example number three, uh, we're going to discuss the failure to canonicalize file paths. Um, and this uh, results in a directory traversal attack, also known as a dot dot slash attack. Again, the result of the application taking input without proper, properly validating it. Um, so okay, so here we are showing the GE Carescape, and while we were playing around with this device, we had noticed that there was some functionality to view log files. So we clicked on you know the view logs button, as you can see in the left-hand panel, and we were presented with the sub modules for viewing logs. Well, when we clicked on one of these buttons, we see that the device issues an API request to the server or excuse me, that the client, our web browser, and there is this um, get request to the view log file .cgi file, and there is an HTTP parameter that is passed called link name, and if you notice the value of link name, it looks awfully familiar uh, or similar to a file path, um, and sure enough, var log messages is a directory, or is a file that exists on a Linux system, um, and if you were to request this file, you're going to get the message as well. Well, we can play around with that again and use the dot dot slash sequence and just back up a little bit. And then we're gonna go back in you know, to the Etsy directory and access Shadow. Well, as you guys know, this attack will, would succeed if the application was vulnerable to directory traversal and if we had permission to read the Shadow file. That's owned by root. Hopefully this doesn't work. Oh crap, it worked. <laughs> All right, so. 
there's, there are two serious issues here. One, we've demonstrated that an attacker is able to, are identified and is able to exploit a directory traversal vulnerability. And we've also demonstrated that the web server that is running this vulnerable application is running with root permissions, or at least the code that was accessing that file was privileged. Um, so we were able to read files owned by root. So essentially any file on the file system, we're able to access um, through this vulnerable application. Um, the next vulnerability we're gonna discuss is the use of outdated software. So in a lot of cases, the, um, the severity of this issue could be, uh, could be on opposite ends of the spectrum, right? You could have, a, um, I don't know, a simple information disclosure that may be rated as a low severity, um, or you could have a vulnerability that leads to remote code execution that would be rated as like, higher critical severity. Um, so when you see this classification of use of outdated software, um, the, the, I guess the, re the end result could be disastrous or it could be fairly benign. Well, in this case, we're just looking around at the system and we had noticed some interesting files and these interesting files made us look at some you know, bugs that have been recently published and a big one is the shell shock. Uh, quick show of hands, who's familiar with the shell shock or the bash shock bug? Most of you, as you should be, awesome. Um, so really, quick, this, uh, this bug um, exists in bash um, and it's the result of improper or inadequate parsing of function definitions. So what actually happens is if you have a, um, excuse me, if you have an environment variable and that environment variable contains a function definition, whether it's correct or not, it just has to be syntactically correct, any trailing characters are going to be interpreted and actually executed. So what you can do is set up an environment variable to contain a bogus function definition uh, and then have whatever attack string that you want to execute following that definition and bash will go ahead and incorrectly parse it and execute those commands. That's pretty awesome. So like I said, we're playing around with the device and again, I mentioned CGI files when we were talking about directory traversal. Here it is again, view log file .cgi. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. Given the way that you know CGI files are handled by, I don't know, certain web servers, maybe, maybe or not, maybe not, uh, maybe or maybe not, uh, will this thing be vulnerable to shell shock? So really quick, we, knowing that it leverages CGI, knowing of the existence of Shellshock, we quickly constructed a payload. And uh, there's a picture of, a, of my colleague's terminal here, Jake Thompson, he's actually sitting in the audience over here. So, hello, Jake. Hi, Jake. <laughs> um, but as you can see, uh, we are, we're using curl. It actually might be hard for you to see, but we're using curl. And basically we're going to make a post to this web server and in the user agent we have a function definition, which by the way, the user agent gets set as a specific environment variable in Nix-based OS's. This is part of the reason why this is gonna work. So we have, uh, we have our function definition and then after it we have a string, an attack string, starting with the word bash. And really what that is, is running bash in interactive mode and then we, if you notice the redirection, we're going to read in from slash dev um, as the input to the bash interactive mode. And the slash dev is actually going to make a connection to us because we're going to use the, uh, a TCP device to connect back out to us and then use some input redirection to be able to interact with this uh, shell in interactive mode. So we send this to the server and fingers crossed, bam, reverse shell. <laughs> okay, so we were able to compromise device, compromise this device without authentication from a remote perspective using um, a well-known vulnerability. As you can see, we have the shell, who am I root? <sighs> I'm talking really fast. All right, so now we're gonna get into attack anatomies. Um, and yeah, really quick, we have a list of the, excuse me, not a list, but we have a picture that has a list of locations um, of various hospitals that were uh, part of our study. So really quick, attack anatomy number one. Um, we're going to basically own a hospital from a remote vantage point, and how are we going to do that? We're going to go in through an external web application. So what are the attack steps here? Well, as a remote adversary wanting to break into a hospital, I need to figure out how to break the perimeter of the hospital first, right? So obviously I need to circumvent the perimeter. Uh, once the perimeter has been circumvented and we're inside the network, we have to pivot uh, within the hospital. And once we are pivoting, we have to compromise an end system and then we hopefully profit. Uh, okay, so 
problems. How do you circumvent the perimeter? Well, first you have to identify external endpoints. Um, and in this case, while we were working with the hospital, uh, we were looking at their IP range, we had found um, an endpoint that was, that was used for, I guess, data collection. Um, I gotta be careful with some of the details that I revealed to you guys. So we used, they used this endpoint for data collection. Um, it was exposed without authentication. We figured this would be you know, a great avenue of attack. Um, so we started messing around with the, um, the external web server and the application, and we attempted to identify and obviously exploit vulnerabilities. Well, once doing that, once we owned the web server, we had a system on the network. We essentially were in a privileged location, and from there we had to, I guess, go further into the network. And how do you do that? You're gonna have to map internal systems, and then from there you're gonna continue to pivot. Um, and that's the exploitation of identified systems. Okay, so as you're pivoting through the network, you need to have, I guess, an, an end goal in mind. And our goal, our end goal was to find and compromise a medical device um, that would allow us to induce harm to a patient. So here, quickly, is a, a demo. These demos aren't live demos, but I will talk to you about them as they're going. So could somebody kill a patient from another country? The answer is yes. And what we were able to do is demonstrate that a remote attacker could compromise an external facing web application using SQL injection vulnerabilities um, and file inclusion vulnerabilities. I had to redact that from the presentation, sorry guys. And then from there, um, we're, they're able to pivot throughout hospital machines on various network segments. And from there, you compromise a vulnerable medical device and you can induce harm to a patient. And they, they may fall over just like that. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe not. So yes, from an external perspective, um, you can definitely induce harm to a patient, and you profit. The profit is harming your patient. Um, attack anatomy number two. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. Um, I just demonstrated, uh, or at least talked about, how it's possible for an attacker from a different country or some remote location you know, to, to harm a patient. And this next attack, um, anatomy, is remote, but argue, ar it's local, but arguably it's remote. And what I mean by that is we're gonna leverage a guest kiosk, um, and the vantage point is the hospital lobby. So again, as usual, we have to circumvent the perimeter of the hospital network, we have to pivot within the network, and then we have to compromise an end system and profit. The profiting is going to be the harming of a patient. So here is a picture of a hospital one of the hospitals that we've actually attacked, and there's an arrow pointing to a guest lobby, or a guest kiosk, excuse me. Um, really quick, this kiosk was used for like, I guess, visitor registration. You can go up to it, it's in a kiosk mode, you type in some data and it will print out like a, a banner or a sticker or whatever you wanna call it. Okay, so circumvent the perimeter. Well, we talked about the, the uh, hospital kiosk. It's in kiosk mode, there's you know no you have, there's no ability for an attacker to do anything that interface with this kiosk mode. So you think. Well, we start thinking about, I guess, okay, what is this kiosk? Well, it's obviously a computer. We see that there aren't any physical connections, so it's obviously connected to the network over wireless. Okay, well, that's good to know. How might these technologies be implemented? So you kind of start thinking about, I guess, what a kiosk is, what's involved, and how somebody would have implemented it. And a common thing that you find these days are a lot of kiosk modes are actually web applications. So I got to thinking, okay, maybe it's a web client. Well, let's play around. Well, as we're playing around, we had figured out that, oh, hey, there's no Windows key, there's no way to escape out of this mode, but it is a web client. What about right click? Well, you right click, sure enough, it's a web page, and you get this awesome dialog box that says, I don't know, view source or view page source. Well, you can click on that, okay? All of a sudden, you get a lovely you know, developer tool like Window that has all of the source code for the page you're reviewing. That doesn't sound very useful, does it? Yeah, it eh, not in isolation, but that Window also happens to have a save button, okay? So you go file, save, what happens? You get this nice little you know, pop-up dialog you know, that's allowing you to browse your file system and choose a, uh, a location to save a file. Something you may not know about Windows is in that little save dialog, if you navigate to a file and hit enter, that file is going to open. Well, cmd.exe is a file, isn't it? 
Yes. <laughs> so we did exactly that, and this picture shows it. We navigated to cmd.exe, immediately got a command prompt, and behind the command prompt, you can actually see the save dialog that I'm referring to. So awesome, we have a shell. Sweet, what can you do with it? Well, I don't know. Pivot? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this user, or the user on this machine was actually a domain user, and this kiosk was uh, connected to a privileged Wi-Fi network. So this hospital had a guest network, uh, guest wireless network, excuse me. This wasn't attached to that, nope. It was attached right to the privileged network. So we immediately had a domain user on the privileged network. From here, we're able to, you know, pivot. So again, just showing you um, a closer or a zoomed in picture of the terminal. Um, you, there are two arrows. The bottom arrow is just showing that, hey, look at kiosk machine. And the second arrow is just pointing to a reflection of me that has my visitor band on. Um, and then the next picture here is from our shell, we're pretty much able to do whatever we want. Um, and I'm just demonstrating that we had the ability to you know, download and execute code. And in this particular example, I'm showing the um, use of the PuTTY client. We downloaded it, executed it, and from there, we're able to you know, leverage Secure Shell to help pivot throughout the network. Um, yeah, port forwarding is awesome stuff. So from there, compromise an a medical device, and you just continue pivoting until you find the individual or device that you're after, and you're going to profit. So oops, sorry, another demo. So could somebody kill a patient from a hospital lobby? Well, the answer is yes. Um, so just kind of recapping what we did, broke out of the kiosk mode, we got a command prompt. From the command prompt, um, we were able to download code, and from there, pivot throughout the network. Um, waiting on the video. Uh, and then as we pivoted through the network, we identified devices, compromised the devices, and then you're ultimately able to harm a patient. Um, this video is a little different. It's showing actual barcode scanner. So one of the devices we were able to reach um, was a medical dispenser uh, or a medicine dispenser. <laughs> I forget exactly what they call them. <laughs> um, but you're able, to, ultimately, I guess you'd be able to change the prescription uh, that was administered to a patient. So we've now demonstrated that from a remote, a remote vantage point, whether it's across the street, another country, wherever, and from within the hospital, but arguably remote, um, you're able to you know, induce harm to patients. So the third attack anatomy is strikingly different than the first two, uh, but it's, I don't know, probably gonna result in the same way. Uh, I've noticed I said a result a lot in this presentation, by the way. Um, anyway, so attack anatomy number three, social engineering. Um, our overview here, our objective here is instead of cracking the perimeter like we've done in the past two, we're gonna crack the healthcare practitioner. Um, how are we going to do that? We're going to exploit the human factor. Um, ultimately, we're prying on an individual's, I guess, innate ability to trust everybody. Vantage point, who knows? I mean, you could, you could be anywhere. It just really depends on the type of attack that you're trying to carry out. So really quick, social engineering, um, I'm sure most of you are, but who is not familiar, familiar with social engineering? Nice, awesome. Okay, uh, so really quick, social engineering, uh, the use of deception to manipulate individuals. So that's kind of a politically correct way to put it, but in other words, you're lying to people to get them to do what you want. Um, so, okay, how did this attack work? Well, we decided to actually leverage USB devices um, as opposed to uh, a phishing campaign. Um, yeah, that's pretty, pretty much the, the main avenue for social engineering. So we prepared uh, malware-infected USB sticks, and we delivered the sticks to the hospital and dropped them off in, in various locations. Um, we waited for infection, and then you profit. So preparing uh, malware-infected USB sticks. Here is a picture of one of the USB devices that we actually used. Uh, they happen to be rubber duckies. Are you guys familiar with rubber duckies? Yes? Cool. Um, rubber duckies, really quick. That's a tool developed by Hack5. Um, it's an HID device to where there is a ducky scripting language, which is ultimately a way to interface with their devices. Um, and yeah. Um, delivering the malware USB sticks. So once we prepare these sticks, um, 
how did we infect the hospital? Well, we pretty much walked in the hospital just like we did when we accessed the lobby, and we just dropped them off in any location that we could access. So anywhere from uh, a nurse's station, a front desk, cafeteria, you name it. Any area we were able to access, we dropped them off, and we dropped about 20 devices off. So now we have to wait. This is the boring part, but it always ends with smiley faces. <laughs> um, so, you're right. <laughs> Somebody else was maybe smiling, but yeah. Um, so we keep waiting, wait, 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 and all of a sudden, ding, we caught our first fish. So within 24 hours, somebody had plugged in a drive and it's ultimately game over. Wow, what just happened? Okay, so another demo for you. So could a USB flash drive kill a patient? Um, the short answer, yes. Um, so as I said, we prepared these malicious USB sticks, we dropped them off in various locations in the hospital, some unsuspecting users picked these flash drives up, and in some cases, plug them in one or more times. And from there, it's exactly as I said. Once they plug in that drive, we have access to a machine, pivot through the network, you find a medical device or the patient you're after, and it's game over. And I'm sorry to say, but <laughs> score bad guys three, score hospital zero. <laughs> or negative three, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, you, you profit. Um, okay, examined security aspects. Now we're going to talk about the human factor. Um, this is interesting. So I just talked about the social engineering, um, attack anatomy, and how you can leverage a malicious flash drive to compromise a hospital um, and ultimately induce harm to a patient. Um, now we're going to actually talk about um, a more benign payload that was leveraged um, in these devices, and this was used for data aggregation. Um, so basically, we conducted a separate USB experiment. We wanted to know how many people would plug these devices in and what types of individuals. And when I, when I say what types of individuals, I'm referring specifically to their role within the hospital. Would it just be you know, healthcare practitioners, such as nurses or doctors, or will we start seeing help desk and maybe you know, higher level uh, technical engineers plug in these devices in as well. Um, these flash drives consisted of a PowerShell payload. This was the meat of, uh, I guess, the attack. Um, and it required a logging server, uh, which I wrote um, in PHP, just essentially a very small, concise server that leverages a couple of API calls to log data. And we're going to gather information about the victim, uh, the IP address, the username, computer name, and a device ID. So here's a picture of the flash drives of, the, of a rubber ducky, those beautiful HIE devices. They're so much fun. Um, here is the attack payload that was used. Very hard for you guys to read. I apologize. Uh, but it's just a ducky script. What's important is the highlighted part here, which you may or may not be able to read. Uh, but really, all that we're doing here um, is invoking an instance of the PowerShell web client class and then um, calling the download string method um, on that object. And what that's going to do is just issue a, a web request um, and it's going to call my API with the data that we gathered. And here is the table of results. So in this table, it's hard for you guys to read. Um, we, we caught several fish. Uh, we had several nurses plug in these devices. We've had uh, network engineers plug in these devices, so some of their core administrators that we actually worked with uh, throughout the course of our research, yet they plugged in these devices, um, as well as some hospital executives. Um, so we pretty much compromised all layers of a hospital. Pretty much any department you would want to have access to, yeah, we, we definitely gained access to it. Yeah, the Lenovo PCs, yeah. Um, division of responsibilities. Um, so this is kind of a unique thing in that not every hospital um, is in this, has this predicament, uh, but while we, were, while we were working with some of the engineers in the hospital, uh, they have actually oftentimes were heavily distracted doing, I guess, I don't know, I don't want to call it meaningless, but 
less important tasks, such as resetting a user's password. So you have individuals who are combating uh, malware-infected machines who are then interrupted to go and reset you know, Joe Schmo's password. Um, so there's definitely a discrepancy between what responsibility, what is the responsibility and whose role is responsible for the responsibility. Okay, so examine security aspects. Um, we had the use of outdated software, systems with known malware infections, missing or unenforced security policies, undocumented systems, and unregulated vendors. All of which led to disastrous things that we'll talk about. So the use of outdated software. Uh, within the hospital, we found a large number of Windows XP machines, as well as Windows Server 2003. We all know that Server 2003 and XP are no longer supported. Um, and pretty much, I don't want to say, okay, lots of servers and workstations are missing security patches. Um, that's a very polite way to say it. Um, so really quick, we, I mentioned Windows XP Server 2003. That's pretty terrible. As attackers, we get really happy when we see those types of things. Um, this has nothing to do with the hospital, but it could, you could ar arguably make a point that maybe hospitals are a little more secure than, I don't know, other industries such as airlines. I was boarding an aircraft and happened to notice a Windows 98 computer booting up. Yeah, it's, that's reassuring, you know, knowing that the 740, uh, 747 that I'm flying on is, you know, operating on Windows 98. It's pretty cool. Um, so if that's not frightening, I, don't, I honestly don't know what is. Um, we are, I mentioned systems with known malware infections. Uh, so I have a screenshot here that's actually showing uh, an antivirus um, engine, and it detected some web-based exploit, and there are quite a few files that are infected according to the AV engine. Um, well, this is a, a hospital computer. Uh, more importantly, this is a computer that's actually running a pharmacy within a hospital, um, and it has no malware infection. I also think the people responsible for running this machine um, are avid shoppers, as they have multiple instances of uh, coupon printer service.exe running and listening on various network ports. And they just must be looking for some great deals. I, <laughs> I don't know. Or, or maybe they're just handing out free shells to everybody. <laughs> Either way, it's no bueno. Um, okay, so missing and unenforced security policy. Hospitals appear to have very little, um, I guess, secure computing policies. Uh, there really isn't a whole lot of, I guess, training that goes into informing staff what they should and shouldn't do on a computer. Um, an example would be every individual that you know, picked up and plugged in one of our flash drives. They obviously haven't been you know, clearly instructed on common techniques of, common social engineering techniques. Um, a lot of this stuff is exemplified by earlier topics of discussion. Uh, the use of outdated software. If you have a bunch of systems that are running outdated software, you probably don't have a policy that is for you know, patching your systems. Um, systems with no malware infections, again, if you are aware of a system with a malware infection, you should have some protocol for handling said system. Um, if they're just running rampant on your network and you're not really doing anything to remove them from your network, it's indicative of a, of a, a lacking or absent policy. Um, and then I already mentioned the using untrusted peripherals, but that's a really big one. Um, don't plug in flash drives you find on the ground. I, I, I don't know what else to say. Um, so undocumented systems. <laughs> this is great. So we're actually um, in, the net, in the hospital. Uh, we were performing uh, a port scan. We identified some outdated, I believe it was like Debian 6 or something, um, some really old machine. And we actually inquired with the hospital, one of their engineers, and uh, we asked them, you know, what was the purpose of this machine and where was it located? Well, unfortunately, they didn't know the answer to either of those questions. So this is exactly what happened. Um, they, they couldn't find the machine, so they had to literally trace Ethernet cables from their server room to patch panels to, you know, to the room where the server ultimately resided. Um, funny stuff. <laughs> so unregulated vendors. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, something I didn't know until I actually got into, I guess, hospital security, I'll call it was that 
in a ho within a hospital network, there are several different departments. Um, an example I'll use is the pharmacy. Uh, the pharmacy from the hospitals that we looked at wasn't directly affiliated with the hospital. They're kind of like a contractor, so to speak. So what happens is these external contractors, I'll call them, comes into the hospital. Um, the hospital engineering uh, team kind of sets them up with an, an environment to deploy their computer systems, and then they're left unchecked. So to a degree, you could think of a hospital acting as an ISP. Um, but what ends up happening is that the vendors end up dictating to the hospital engineers how the network should be architected, you know, what types of systems and data should be permitted through the firewall or through other uh, network segments. And it ends up leading to a very insecure environment for the hospital as a whole. Um, and I guess it, what boils, what happens next, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, are the security issues, okay, so yeah, with, the, with these environments the, uh, that are deployed by vendors, excuse me, I lost my train of thought. These, in, these vendors deploy these environments, the hospital takes a very hands-off approach. Once it's up and running, they don't question anything. Um, and because of that, the systems that reside on these networks um, end up becoming, I guess, subject to attack, and in some cases compromised, as I demonstrated with the malware infections, and the IT staff just ignores them. Their hands-off approach is not their problem. So what do we do to kind of address these issues? Um, emphasis needs to be put on the fact that patient health is more important than patient health records. Okay, so that's a big thing. On a lot of cases today, you'll hear hospitals or manufacturers of medical devices talking about HIPAA and you know other compliance standards that I guess are their core focus. Well, I can tell you in most cases, none of these standards state that you know the health or the well-being of an individual is is a concern. They're more or less concerned with the um, with the confidential confidentiality of data talking about the patient, right? So the health of the patient is irrelevant. The information about a patient's health is relevant. Um, so there kind of needs to be like a, a paradigm shift as to what is the focus or what should be the focus of security. Um, hospital IT, they need to take control of their networks from device vendors. It should really be the opposite way around, um, or the reciprocal of what I said. Uh, can somebody tell me when was the last time you dictated to your ISP, you know, what your bill should be, or you know, how much bandwidth you should have? You probably, it's probably never happened. And in this case, you know, vendors shouldn't be dictating to hospital IT staff how their network should be ran and operated. Um, threat modeling, threat modeling is very important. Ultimately, it there we go with the ultimately. Um, it allows you to quantify the risk. Um, quantify the risks posed to an organization by identifying all the possible threat, a threat actors, um, your assets, and vulnerabilities. With a, prop with a proper threat model, you're not gonna prevent the ability to, um, I, I guess, you're not, you're not gonna be invulnerable to attack, but you're definitely going to limit the damages should you be attacked and actually compromised. Um, and then finally, FDA regulations are way too strict. Um, hardware and software certification, um, specifically, so medical devices, they have to be certified. And once they're certified, um, if any change is made to the device, that entire certification process has to be uh, gone through again. And that's very costly to manufacturers. So in a lot of, oftentimes they decide to ignore security issues or ignore other types of um, issues um, unless they're forced to address them. Uh, hold on one second. Um, and yeah, that's, pretty much my presentation. Um, thank you guys, I appreciate it. And I spoke incredibly fast, so we have more time for Q&A than I had expected. So I guess that's a positive thing or a negative thing. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll open up the floor to questions. One slide.
Yeah, so the specifics of the certification process, I'm not intimately familiar with, but I do know that there. Yeah, right, right. So I know that there is a clause that certain changes are permitted without the device having to go through a recertification. But if you were to address a, let's say, um, one of those web vulnerabilities that I had discussed earlier in the software and it produced a new firmware file, then I'm pretty sure you're going to have to go through that certification process again. Um, what? Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Right, yeah. Case in point. I have not. No, interesting, yeah. No, I'm not familiar with that. Um, if you have more information on that, I'd actually like to uh, talk to you about it, so. Uh, I am not now. Yep. I do know I am the Calvary. Oh, okay, well, yeah. Okay, okay. Yep. Okay, cool. Thanks for the tip. Appreciate it. Um, any other questions? Yes? Can you repeat your question? Yes, so they would be one of the vendors. And actually, I forgot to mention that um, in this talk, uh, but I, I mentioned no malware infections. Um, there was one hospital that had a Starbucks in it, as well as some other, I guess, food, whatever. Um, and they had a cash register that went down. Um, the cash register actually had a bunch of database errors, and one of their, uh, the engineers received a, a phone call from an ISP, actually, and somebody was actually being DDoSed by this hospital. And the hospital found out that they were compromised because somebody called them and told them, hey, you're attacking me, quit DDoSing me. Um, so their solution to the problem was to just block the outgoing ports of that machine and they didn't touch the machine. I mean, <laughs> forget that you have malware running rampant on your network, you know? <laughs> so to answer your question, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so really, most medical devices, and I'm gonna make, it, I'm gonna make a point here. So most medical devices these days, um, you know, are, they're IP enabled. They have the ability to be controlled over a network. So to your point, yes, it's definitely true. Now the devices that we looked at um, were passive devices, uh, meaning that they were, they were monitors. They didn't actively, you know, ad administer medications, other than that uh, one medicine, like dispenser thing I talked about. Um, so yeah, to your question, um, yes, there are machines such as insulin pumps and other uh, like uh, x-ray machines that are controlled over the network. You could definitely you know, actively harm somebody. Um, so the devices that we looked at being passive, we would, I guess, manipulate the type of information that was reported to a nurse and the wrong type of medication you know, would be administered. But yeah, any, any medical device you can think of, it's IP enabled. Any other questions over here? Yes? I have no idea. I still don't think they know what it was being used for, but at least they found it. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, that's what it was, it ended up being a vendor? Yeah, so okay, that's why. Okay. Oh man, I don't think any time is spent on security. Uh, that's just my opinion. <laughs> uh, I can't say that definitively, but I would say little to no effort at all. Um, any other questions? Yes? Oh, we're definitely going to see more of it. So, like, a couple of years ago, I mean, Soho routers have been known to be vulnerable for a long time, right? Uh, a couple of years ago, I had talked about them being incredibly vulnerable. Um, so have many other researchers. And what ended up happening is we started seeing, you know, malware targeting these devices. There was the, the moon room. The moon room compromised a bunch of Linksys routers. They were using a botnet. We recently saw this, you know, botnet that was made up of DVRs and a bunch of cameras. Um, I mean, this is 
in the news like as of yesterday. Um, so to your question, yes, these devices are going to continue to be compromised. Hospitals are going to continue to be targeted. And in a lot of cases, I feel like it's actually going to get worse as the focus has been currently on getting into a hospital or compromising the uh, health records of a patient, but not actually killing people. Like we haven't actually seen in a real world somebody compromise a hospital in an attempt to kill somebody. You know, when that happens, I, I think people are going to have a rude awakening, you know, that this is a, an issue that needs to be addressed. So, yeah, I, I definitely think this is going to continue to happen. So. Any other questions? Yes? I was just going to Right. Yeah, I knew it was a multi-month process. I, I thought it was closer to like a six-month window, but you said four to 12, that's, wow, <laughs> yeah. So in a lot of cases, um, network segmentation would reduce the impact of an attack, right? It doesn't make you invulnerable. Um, you can make a lot of these systems unaccessible to an attacker, uh, but again, all it would take was somebody to plug a flash drive into a network segment you know, that has a vulnerable device, and from there it's game over. Any other questions? Yes? Um, yeah, it's definitely going to depend on the hospital, right? Not every hospital is architected in the same way. And what I mean by architected, I mean the network and the servers. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to depend on the hospital. Uh, but really, what we had found that there wasn't a single hospital that we evaluated that did any type of uh, cross-network um, access, didn't have any type of cross-network access control. So once you were on the internal network, even though things were properly subnetted, you could just pivot between the networks freely. So any other questions? No? Well, thank you guys for, you know, coming to my talk. I appreciate it. <laughs>